So, um, thank you very much. And um, would like to, to present here uh, an interpretation which I've called uh, convivial solipsism. We are going to see why, because of course, uh, this, this term is a little bit provocative, but uh, I will explain why uh, this, uh, 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 this is the name of the interpretation. Um, I, I will start by uh, um, well-known paradoxical fact, uh, the fact that uh, while all physicists agree on how to use quantum mechanics to compute the results of the experiments, uh, there is no general consensus regarding what the theory means to reality. Um, actually, taken at uh, face value, the principles of quantum mechanics imply non-determinism, superposition, entanglement, contextuality, non-locality, uh, all features that are very strange from an intuitive classical point of view, and it's not very clear how to handle these concepts. The orthodox interpretation that was uh, largely widespread and accepted by the majority of physicists is the, the Copenhagen interpretation built by Bohr and uh, Heisenberg. Roughly speaking, uh, it can be described as a sort of uh, instrumentalist position even if there are many subtleties inside it. Now, a large number of physicists don't want to worry about these questions and either say that they have been solved by Bohr or uh, the physicists adopt a pragmatic attitude and uh, they say that they do physics and not philosophy. But many of us are interested in understanding more deeply the, the physical meaning of the theory. That's the reason why we are here. Uh, and depending on their own sensibility, um, they are uh, inclined to reject one or several of the strange consequences of quantum mechanics. And they try to give interpretations uh, that avoid them, or even they try to modify the formalism. Uh, yesterday, we've heard um, the very interesting conference of Professor Tuf to aiming at keeping determinism as a fundamental feature. A convivial solipsism stems from the reject of the many words interpretation expressed first by Bernard d'Espagna in his book, The Conceptual Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, in 1971. Bernard uh, d'Espagna, besides some technical problems of uh, this interpretation, uh, for example, the way to get back probabilities inside the theory, or the problem of the preferred basis, and many others, uh, Bernard d'Espagna was not satisfied at all with the stupendous number of words, in fact, infinite and even continuously infinite, uh, that are assumed in this interpretation. And following him, I have developed an interpretation which avoids uh, this proliferation of words while taking uh, Everett's ideas, initial Everett ideas, into account to, to keep what is interesting in the, the attempt uh, from Everett. So that's what I'm going to uh, try to, to explain. Um, all this... Um, attempts to give interpretations come mainly from uh, the famous problem of measurement. Of course, there are many other problems inside quantum mechanics, but the, the most famous is the problem of measurement. And I just briefly recall what it is, but uh, I know that you are familiar with that, so I, I'm going to be very fast on that. Um, inside the, the, the formalism of the quantum mechanics, we have two contradictory postulates. The first one is the Schrodinger equation, uh, which is to be applied when a system evolves independently of any measurements. And the second one is the reduction postulate, uh, mainly introduced by uh, Dirac, which says that uh, when a system is in a superposition, uh, or a state uh, constituted by many uh, eigenstates of the observable that is measured, then after the measurement, when you get one value, 
then the state of the system is projected, is reduced to only the eigenstates corresponding to the eigenvalue that has been measured. Now, this measurement process can be seen under two different points of view. Uh, I briefly recall that. Uh, if you have a system S and an apparatus A, then uh, before uh, the interaction between the apparatus and the system, which constitute the measurement, the ground system state is the product of the initial state of the system and the apparatus. Uh, that means that uh, this is the entangled state, uh, sigma, the ci, phi, i, a0. And after the interaction between S and A, that means after the measurement, then you have two points of view that are possible. The first one is to consider the ground system, uh, system plus apparatus as a global system, which is not uh, the object of any measurements. And then the Schrodinger equation says that after the interaction, uh, the uh, system, uh, the, the global um, wave function of the ground system is this entangled wave function where the state of the apparatus are correlated to the state of the system itself. But another point of view is possible is to say that the, they have been a, a measurement and that you will get the observer uh, got a, a, a definite value and, and in this case, you have to use the reduction postulate, and uh, you have that the apparatus has been projected into one of the possible states, and this is the state that is created to the eigenstate of the system that is linked to the eigenvalue that you get from the measurement. The problem is there's two uh, descriptions are uh, all legitimate, and they don't give the same result. So it seems that uh, there is a logical inconsistency inside the quantum formalism, and that's what is usually called the problem of measurement. I'm not going, of course, to describe every uh, paper that have been written on that because uh, it is many, many, many uh, thousands pages of paper, uh, mainly, uh, for example, that uh, uh, allowed the, the, the sources to uh, try uh, to uh, give many different solutions. Uh, for example, Wigner and London and Bauer um, thought that uh, it was necessary to uh, take the role of consciousness of the observer in, into account. Uh, other physicists tried to modify the formalism, for example, uh, the hidden variable of uh, the bird bomb or the spontaneous collapse theory of Girardi, Rimini, Weber. And of course, uh, many interpretations have been given. Um, I, I just give a, a list of some of them because that's interesting to see how many uh, uh, different interpretations have been given. Uh, Bohr and the Copenhagen interpretation was the first one I, I quote. Uh, many instrumentalist positions, including pragmatism, um, mainly interpretation uh, wanting to avoid to say that quantum physics directly speaks about the, the, the world, about the real world, but uh, using the quantum formalism mainly as a tool for predicting the result of a possession uh, without uh, willing, without being willing to say, to say that uh, what quantum physics says is about the world. Uh, more recently, Carlo Rovelli uh, proposed the relational interpretation. Um, a number of physicists uh, invented the quantum biasinism and, of course, uh, the Everett interpretation in many different versions and many others. Uh, I'm not going here to uh, give uh, all the reason why I'm not satisfied with all that interpretation, because that would be very, very long. Uh, but for each one, there is a failure and something that is not really well working. Uh, that's true for Copenhagen, for Wigner, Nungen and Bauer, for Everett, in the different version for uh, the interpretation of Carlo Rovelli for quantum Bayesianism, and uh, no interpretation really succeed in uh, giving uh, a satisfying global interpretation of quantum mechanics and solving the um, measurement problem. So uh, there is a series of questions uh, that 
to my um, view, uh, a satisfying interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, would give a satisfying question. Uh, I give you that. I, I just read the series of questions. Uh, what is a measurement? The first question is, nobody is really able to define in a rigorous way what a measurement is. So the first question is, what is a measurement? When and why only one of the many possible results is selected? If the measurement does not reveal a pre-existing value, which is uh, uh, usually accepted by all physicists, how is it possible that this value be created during the measurement? Does this value so created belong to the system itself, to the system and the apparatus, or does it concern an external reality or merely the knowledge of the observer? And depending on how you answer this question, you get many different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Why is measurement contextual? If even macroscopic systems can become entangled, why don't we observe macroscopic superpositions? How do we know which observable is measured when we use an apparatus? And how must we understand the non-locality shown by Bell's inequalities? And is there any instantaneous action at a distance? <laughs> All these questions are uh, big questions that are uh, analyzed in uh, details by many searchers trying to propose interpretations. But how I, what I, I said just before is that to my point of view, no one, uh, no interpretation succeeded in giving satisfying answer, answer to all these questions. And in convivial solipsism, my goal is to try to answer this question in a natural and uh, rigorous way, even if we are going to see uh, this will result in a picture of reality that is really strange. And of course, that's a, that's a problem, but I think that no interpretation of a quantum mechanics is able to restore uh, the intuitive image that we, we got from classical physics that is something that is now uh, admitted by everybody. Uh, so, uh, giving an interpretation and trying simultaneously to all those questions is very difficult. Uh, a first step is uh, the decoherence mechanism. I'm not going to uh, give details of the decoherence mechanism. I suppose that you, you are familiar with, with it. I'm just going to see what it achieves uh, and what it doesn't achieve. Uh, I recall that uh, the, uh, the decoherence came from uh, the, a remark from Z in 1970 that no system is really totally isolated and that taking the environment uh, into account, uh, the final step was made direct in 1981 to provide models that are um, satisfying uh, regarding to what we call now the decurrent process. So I'm going to uh, skip uh, the, the mathematical formalism just to go directly to the conclusion because the goal is not to make a, a Confront on decurrent here, but uh, what is important is that uh, the decurrent process consists in taking the partial trace of the density matrix uh, of the system, the apparatus, and the environment, and taking this partial trace, uh, we get a diagonal density matrix which has been assimilated to the equivalent of a classical mixture, then solving the problem of the superposition. That's the usual way the coherence process is understood. Uh, so uh, at the very beginning of the, 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 the decurrence presentation, even Zurek said that it was solving the measurement problem. And then after many criticism of, of that, we know that it's not the case now. Uh, the reason why it's not totally solving the measurement problem are um, multiple. The, the first one is that the non-diagonal terms, uh, the terms that are uh, responsible for superpositions, 
uh, and that are supposed to be controlled by the diagonal, um, the, the partial trace, can become big again, of course, after a very, very, very long time, but they are not strictly zero. Uh, the second reason, but that means that if we wait uh, long enough, uh, the superposition will come back. Of course, we have to wait very, very, very uh, long time. Uh, the second reason is the, that the, the partial trace, which is responsible for this diagonalization, is taken because we take into account the fact that we are not able, as human um, beings, to measure all the um, uh, degrees of liberty of the environment, because there are so, not too, too many. And uh, the, the, the fact to take the partial trace is directly linked to the fact that we are neglecting all those degrees of liberty. But uh, this is not something that is fundamental in physics. This is just linked to our inability to measure all those degrees of liberty. So that's something that is linked to us and not linked to the system. Uh, the third point is that the diagonal density matrix that is got from the partial trace is not, in fact, the density matrix of a proper mixture that's uh, resembling to that. But if we analyze what is uh, really this, this density matrix, it's not the density matrix of a proper density mixture, of a proper mixture. And uh, at the end, even if we get a diagonal density matrix, uh, Bell uh, signaled a, a problem that to explain why only one value is selected and why uh, the final state is reduced. That's the famous Bell or an and problem. And that is not solved by the decurrent process. So what we can say is that the decurrent process brings a lot of answer about the following question. The first one, is that it is an explanation of the classical appearance of the world for us. It explains why we, as human beings, with our limited way of uh, awareness, are not able to see superposition in the macroscopical world. The second one is um, that uh, it explains also why there is a preferred basis that is chosen for uh, the observed um, results. I'm not going to enter into detail for that. But what is sure is that the underlying reality, if there is any, I'm present about that, remains in a superposed and intricate entangled state. It's not reduced. So that's not a, 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 a solution for explaining why, according to Dirac and the, the reduction postulate, uh, at the end of a measurement, the system is, would be, really reduced. So, uh, if we just consider the decurrent process, of course it's precious because it gives some explanation about the classical appearance of the world, but uh, it also says that the reduction postulate is nothing but a convenient way to describe the observation, but it doesn't correspond to any real physical process. So, uh, the, the standard recipes of quantum mechanics uh, assume that we know what a measurement is. It is when a measurement is made, and uh, this is when the probability of finding a specific result is given by the corresponding diagonal element of the density matrix. But nowhere inside the formalism of decurrence, it is said what a measurement is. And nowhere inside the quantum mechanics it is described what a measurement is. So even after the decurrent process, we are left with the initial problem. So the question is to answer what is a measurement. And it seems impossible uh, to develop a coherent interpretation of the quantum formalism that avoids making any reference to the concept of an observer endowed with a consciousness. Of course, this is something that a large majority of physicists uh, doesn't like. Um, many physicists would prefer uh, to uh, stick to a strong objective description of the world and to uh, stay inside the framework or the philosophical framework of the classical physics where 
uh, you have the world that is outside, uh, and that would be the same even in the absence of any observer, and that the formalism just describes independently of any observer. Of course, this is something that we would all like, but uh, apparently, I don't know if it will be the case perhaps uh, in 10 years or if, if in 50 years, perhaps somebody will have find a solution. But today, uh, after having analyzed all the interpretation that are given, it seems impossible to explain what is a measurement uh, without taking into account the, the, the observer. And all the attempts in this direction are um, either missing a point or not logical or having a sort of a, a failure in logic in their argumentation. So quantum uh, mechanics, uh, including uh, the observer, seems to be at least an attempt to try to see if we can um, find an interpretation that is coherent, even at the price, uh, to include consciousness, which is something that physicists don't, don't, don't like, and even if it is at the price also to modify the way we have to consider the, the, the reality. So we are going to assume that a measurement is made only when an observation by a conscious mind is made. That is the definition, that is an attempt, and that we are going to see what is the what are the consequences of that. And uh, of course, this is something that has been attempted a long time ago by Wigner, by London and Bora. Uh, even um, von Neumann was was, uh, was uh, willing to try that. The only thing is that at that time, uh, it had been rejected violently by all the community of physicists because they wanted to um, say that uh, the reduction was a real physical process and that was due to the action of the mind on the matter. And of course, this is very difficult to accept that. And this is absolutely not what I have in, in mind and what I'm going to present. So, uh, of course, I want to take into account uh, the observer and the mind of the observer, but I absolutely don't want that this mind has any action on the matter, contrary to London and Bauer, Wigner and, and von Neumann, which is something that is a prime to a sort of dualist interpretation, which is today not acceptable. So I will stick to something that every interpretation uh, has started to do. There is no physical reduction. And convivial solipsism is a sort of adaptation to every interpretation where there is no physical reduction of the, the wave function. And so if there is no physical reduction, we have to explain how it's possible for us to see one result if the wave function of the system um, stays uh, superposed and entangled with the, the other system and the environment. And that's something that uh, Everett gave an, an, uh, an answer uh, I don't agree with, and Carvinvial Solipsism is another uh, attempt to give an answer to this question. I start by Everett interpretation that uh, you all know. Uh, even if it's difficult to uh, um, analyze every interpretation simply because uh, there have been many, many, many different versions of every interpretation, uh, the, the, the initial every interpretation uh, called relative states uh, has been then presented and uh, has been widely uh, spread by uh, Graham and DeWitt um, under the name of many worlds interpretation or many minds by many other physicists, uh, and uh, all that interpretation are not exactly the same. Um, historians say that uh, uh, Everett was not satisfied at all by the presentation that uh, Graham and DeWitt uh, gave of the many worlds way to present this interpretation, and I will stick to the initial Everett interpretation because I don't share at all the way um, there's many worlds or many minds that the potential are given. And that's even the reason why com uh, convivial solipsism has been developed, because Bernard Espagna, uh, with whom I have worked for many years, during many years, 
uh, was totally uh, uh, against this uh, multiplication of words and even worse of multiplication of minds. So what we are going to assume is that there is no reduction and only uh, the Schrodinger equation should be used to compute the uh, dynamics of the world. The physical world uh, remains in a superposed state and everything is deterministic. So this is something that would please, I think, Professor Tooft, because determinism is uh, totally um, kept in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this interpretation. Uh, it's only the observer or in the vocabulary of Everett, it's memory, uh, that is uh, not divided, uh, I, I, I should surprise this mode, but that is uh, uh, aware of only one part of the superposed state. So when you have a, a global wave function, so I, I have written here the wave function of a system, uh, which is in a superposed state, phi i, uh, an apparatus which is intended to do a measurement and which uh, uh, states ai are correlated to the uh, phi i. Then I have also added the uh, state of the environment and then the state of the observer, o i. And at the end of the interaction between the system, the apparatus, the environment and the observer, we get the very large global wave function that is entangled and that is in a superposition state. Okay, that's the wave function of the universe. That is, at this uh, in this picture, it's reduced to the, the system, the apparatus, the environment, and the observer. Of course, in the real world, you're, you had to, to add all, every, every other thing that exists. But here we are just limited to one system, one apparatus, one environment, and one observer. Okay, so we get this superposed wave function. And then we have um, to explain how it's possible to see only one result. Everett answered that um, in a way uh, there are as many observers as there are branches. That means that uh, as soon as uh, the interaction has been done, then uh, the uh, the observer splits into many observers, and each observer is only aware of one part of uh, the, the the wave function, uh, the part uh, which is correlated to one result of measurement. That's not exactly what uh, Everett initial uh, initially said, but that's a presentation that is made by the many world presentation. And it's not very clear in the initial ideas of Everett how it present, he presented that. But uh, the, the way it's presented now is that there are as many observers as branches, as branches uh, or as many minds as branches. Uh, of course, this is not very economical, but uh, that assumes also a certain number of problems. Uh, the first one is that it's very difficult in this case to get back um, probabilities in these in these pictures because nowhere uh, probabilities are uh, present and all the attempts um, and many are done the, even uh, recently to try to explain how probabilities are going back in this picture. Uh, all these attempts are not really satisfying. Uh, the other uh, point is that uh, there is no way to explain why. Uh, a, a preferred basis is chosen. That's coming from decoherence, but of course, uh, decoherence has been uh, dec discovered well after uh, Everett, and at that time, uh, he doesn't, he didn't know about that. Uh, and if we don't um, take into account decoherence, then uh, you see that uh, this entangled wave function could be written in many, many different bases, each one giving possible worlds or possible observers and there is no reason why uh, these uh, states would correspond to the states we really see. So that's also another point that is not very clear in this interpretation. Uh, and then uh, if you take for example uh, the measurement of a spin, uh, half spin particle, 
uh, by a sterner Gerlach apparatus, uh, then you can write that in a, a many different uh, continuously infinite by basis. And that means that uh, you have a continuous infinity of, uh, of uh, observers, uh, which is not very satisfying at all, which is even uh, very, very uh, strange. So that's the reason why Bernard d'Espagna long ago uh, was reluctant to accept this interpretation. Uh, and uh, this gave uh, rise to the, the convivial solipsism that I developed uh, after him. So I now present the, the convivial solipsism. Uh, you have here the, the, the papers uh, where it has been presented uh, for those who are interested. Uh, convivial solipsism is based on two main assumptions. The first one is the hanging on mechanism. I'm going to explain what it is. And the second one is that the states are relative to the observer. Uh, the hanging on mechanism is easy to understand. Uh, I start again with this uh, entangled global wave function describing the world after the measurement. So you have uh, the entangled states between the system, the apparatus, uh, the environment, and the observer. And what the hanging on mechanism says is that when the observer becomes aware of a result, our physical brain remains in a superposed state. So that means that physically nothing happens. And the brain of the observer is in a superposed state. But our consciousness, our awareness, if you prefer, is hung on only to one branch, which is chosen at random according to the Born rule. So we recover Born rule and probabilities. And what that means is that when an observer is looking at a situation that is described by this superposed state, then due to the limitation of our brain, because our brain is not able to become aware of the subtleties of uh, this superposed uh, wave function, we are only able to see one part of it, as if uh, we had filters in our brain uh, preventing us to see the complexity of this superposition. And these filters act for limiting us uh, to see only one part of the superposed state, which is the branch to which we are angled. So that is uh, something that is uh, explaining why, while the uh, superposed states remain in an entangled state, we as observer are only able to see one part and one result. I insist on the fact that uh, this takes into account the awareness of the observer, but of course that contrarily to what uh, Van Neumann, Dirac, London and Bora said, there is absolutely no physical action of the mind, of the brain, of the consciousness on the matter. This is totally separated. It's uh, uh, more... Uh, uh, um, mental mechanism that is limiting us to become aware of what is superposed and we see what is superposed only in a very simplified way due to our mental filter. The second point uh, in the hanging on mechanism is this once the, the consciousness is hung, it's not hung, it's hung on one branch it will hang on only to branches that are daughters of this branch for all the following observations. And thus ensure that if you redo the same measurement, you will find again the same result. It is, of course, a prediction of quantum mechanics. That could seem very strange. And I know that some physicists don't like at all that sort of uh, interpretation because uh, it relies on the, the fact that we separate uh, the physical world with what we can be aware of. But this is something that the neuroscientists uh, are becoming to explore. And there are many, many uh, recent uh, studies about the way our brain functions. 
and they are in agreement with that sort of uh, of, uh, of functioning. And I will just for uh, giving a picture. Of course, this is a just a, a, I'm very present with that. It's just an image, but I, I just want to, you to show uh, this picture, which is uh, well known on the internet. I don't know if you you were uh, you, you have ever seen that. This is the the picture of uh, a spinning dancer. And what is strange with this uh, this uh, picture is that depending on people seeing at the same picture, uh, some will see the dancer spinning clockwise, and some others will see the dancer spinning uh, counterclockwise. And it's even possible with a little bit of training to see this dancer. Uh, Switching from training, from spinning clockwise to spinning counterclockwise. It's not so easy, but if you have a look at it during a few minutes and you try hard, uh, some of you will, uh, succeed in changing the, the sense of rotation of this, uh, this dancer. And of course, I'm very prudent and cautious with that, but this is just an image, but, uh, that illustrates, uh, something, uh, that is similar to what could happen with the, the observation of a superposed state. I would say that this uh, picture is not a picture of a spinning dancer uh, clockwise or uh, counterclockwise. It's just a spin, uh, picture of something that our brain interprets as uh, spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. But the reality is that it's neither spinning Clockwise, neither and counterclockwise. It's in fact, it could be described as a superposition of both sense of rotation. And it's only when you have a look at it that for some of you, you'll be seeing something uh, clockwise, and for the others, you'll be seeing a dancer spinning counterclockwise. And that means that the question, but what is the real sense of rotation, is meaningless. There is no real uh, sense of rotation for this picture. Uh, it's only when you have a look at it that your brain interprets the moving pixels of that picture uh, in a, a sense or in another sense. Of course, I repeat that I'm very prudent about that, but it gives a sort of uh, image of what could happen when we have a look at a superposed state. Uh, the second point is that states are relative to observer. And that's something that is uh, common with uh, many other interpretations that have been given, for example, with uh, Rovelli's uh, relational interpretation, with quantum Bayesianism, uh, and also in a way, in a sense, by, uh, with Everett. Uh, there is no absolute state. A state is relative to an observer. That means that a psi should always be written psi with an index. It's psi for Bob. And there's two uh, principles are what is needed to be added to the usual uh, formalism to give the interpretation of uh, convivial solipsism. Um, so uh, the Angigon mechanism can be uh, summarized like that when at the end you have uh, a global wave function. For example, if you measure uh, half uh, spin particles with uh, a possible plus or minus along the uh, z axis, then at the end, you have this entangled function of the particles, uh, the apparatus, the environment, and the observer. And then uh, having a look at that global wave function, then the observer uh, and being in either uh, the state where he saw plus or the uh, state where he saw minus. But the, our brain remains superposed and physically nothing happens. So that means that uh, God doesn't play dice here, uh, according to the famous uh, Einstein's sentence. Uh, God God doesn't play, play dice because uh, the physical world is only evolving according to the Schrodinger equation, which is a deterministic equation. But you do. 
because it's when you have a look at the uh, separate pool state which is evolving deterministically, then uh, the choice that your brain uh, made is uh, a, a choice that is make at, made at, at random. So that, uh, in a way, uh, the indeterminism of quantum mechanics is not due to the physical mechanisms. It's due to the way we uh, select at random one way to be aware of the, the superposition. Um, I see that, uh, uh, well, uh, time is running, so I'm perhaps uh, going to uh, be brief on the on the, the, the following, uh, just to let a time for discussion. Um, the, the point is that uh, the consciousness uh, remains uh, hung on the branch and daughters of the branch, uh, but can never uh, switch from one branch to another one. And that guarantees that repeating the same measurements will give again the same results. Uh, then I, I switch that, but um, a very important point is um, why this is called convivial solipsism. Uh, of course, the question is uh, that if uh, two observers are looking at the same superposed states, then because uh, each uh, brain could choose different branches, uh, it, it would be possible to have a conflict between two observers, as it is the case with the, the, the spinning dancers. Uh, if you communicate between uh, you, you perhaps some uh, w Bob will say that uh, he has seen the dancer spinning clockwise, and Alice uh, will have say that uh, she, she saw the, the dancer uh, spinning counterclockwise. Uh, in quantum mechanics, that's not possible. And this is due to something that is very important. For any observer, the other observers are nothing else than physical system. And when an observer talks to another observer, this is nothing else than a measurement of the second observer by the first one. Because everything proceeds by physical means. That means that when Allies ask Bob about his results, then she will uh, ask uh, that for a measurement of Bob. And as Allies is hung on to uh, one branch of the superposition, she will hear Bob saying that he will have found exactly the same result that Alice because it's the part of the superposition wave function, the superposed wave function that is linked to the branch to which Alice is hung on, that uh, Alice is, is measuring. And this guarantees that there will be no conflict between what Bob has perceived and uh, what she will hear from Alice. And that's the reason why this is called convivial, because even if we have no way to know what really each observer has seen, then communicating between them cannot lead to any conflict and everything uh, will be in agreement. Uh, that's the, the, the explanation that I will just summarize here. Uh, that's also the reason why in this interpretation there is no spooky action at a distance in the einstein podolsky rosen experiments. So uh, convivial solipsism uh, is able to avoid non-locality. Uh, I'm not going to develop that into details. I just give the, the, the fundamental reason for that. It is the same than for the, the fact that there is no conflict. Uh, assuming that you are just making the usual presentation of the uh, EPR experiments, I just give the, the end of the, the, the story. It's only when Alice asks Bob what value Bob saw, that this value is defined for Alice. Because before Alice asked Bob, that is, measured Bob, Bob was in a superposed state, and everything that was linked to Bob, including the second particle that has been measured very long, far away, was still in a superposed state. And when Alice asks Bob, that is, measured Bob, then she just 
hang on to the uh, part of the superpose wave function that is linked exactly to the value correlated to the value that she measured. And that's absolutely not instantaneously. And that because that happens in the future of allies uh, compared to the measurement that she, she made. And then we don't have the spooky action or the immediate action at a distance, assuming that when allies measured the first particle instantaneously, the result for the second particle was determined. That's absolutely not true because there is no physical action uh, made by the, the measurement. So that solves also the problem of non-locality. Now, there is a strange question uh, that we can ask about this, this uh, way of presenting uh, things. Uh, in case of a measurement of the same observable, for example, the spin along uh, Z axis, is it possible that allies so plus and Bob so minus? And uh, as I said, there can be no conflict. Uh, but what does that mean? Uh, that there is no conflict. Does that mean that the both saw the same thing? And uh, in fact, uh, it's not absolutely not uh, implied, but the, the formalism. And it would be perfectly possible to think that uh, Bob saw minus and uh, Alice saw plus, while Alice asking Bob will hear minus. Okay. And uh, if we extend that in a very strange way, uh, that would mean that you can think that you're talking at a colloquium on quantum mechanics uh, with your friend Bob, while Bob thinks himself that uh, he is eating at a restaurant. And that, that seems very, very, very strange. But the fact is that this is a question that in this framework you can't ask. This is meaningless. Because the sentence... Uh, explaining from an external point of view what really allies so and what really Bob so is not possible to enounce in, in that framework. The sentence could be only said by a meta observer of a third person perspective, a good sort of God perspective, who could know what allies and Bob perceives internally. And such a meta observer, uh, observer does not exist. So in this framework, we are not allowed to speak in third-person perspective. That means that this natural and intuitive question, which receives a, a very strange answer, is not allowed. I know that this is perhaps for certain people choking, but that's the uh, necessity of accepting that sort of description of reality. And uh, this is a, a solipsism because each observer has her own state vectors, independently of the others. And so she lives inside her own branch and has her own perceptions. That's, in the sense, uh, uh, why it is a solipsism. But it's convivial because there are many others observers that are allowed, contrarily to the usual solipsism, which assumes that uh, there is only one people. Uh, there are many others that are allowed and included in the, in the framework, and no conflict is possible. That's why it's a convivial solipsism. But of course, uh, the presentation and the picture it gives of the reality is very strange, because each observer adds her own uh, perception of reality, which could be different from the others, but uh, you are not allowed to ask what is the perception of the other, because it's not something that... Uh, uh, the framework allow you to, to talk about. And convivial solipsism gathers the Everett's initial position, not the many word version, but the initial position where Everett said that uh, the, there is only one world and this world stays in a superposed uh, state. Uh, it includes the coherence and relativity of states in a coherent whole. And uh, it allows, uh, of course, I have not time to develop that, but uh, this is described in the papers. It allows giving, I think, satisfying answers to the question that have been raised at the beginning of this talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, 
And now, could you please uh, uh, turn on your microphones and uh, please go ahead with questions. Can I, can I make a question? Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I found it very interesting uh, to make an approach of all the different uh, theories which we heard before. Uh, but for me, as a biologist, there's still only physical superposition. And I would like uh, to give another tendency from, from biology that it might also be um, um, mental superposition. I would like to show you one slide, if I can. Sure, go ahead, please. Okay. Okay, this slide. Uh, this slide. This slide shows you the measurement problem from a biopsychological uh, conception. Uh, we are the observers. And we make individual uh, experiments. For instance, in the classical Galilee's inclined uh, plane. And we have this individual information with our sense organs. Then we make also reflections. And this reflection concentrate information of many, many individual observations. Then we come here to a concentrate of multiple experiments in this curve. But when we make a measurement, there is only one experiment which leads to one outcome. So the multiple experiments become only one outcome. And this is in a very classical system. The same is true for quantum mechanical predictions. The uh, information, first of all, is individual experiments. Then we concentrate them, multiple experiments, which is resumed in a state vector summary. But when we make one experiment, the concentrated uh, information it becomes only one experiment and one outcome. So for me, uh, from a biopsychological reflection, uh, there is a big summary of all information which is done in by our mental reflection, but when we make the measurement, there's only one experiment and therefore the clash of uh, the, the collapse. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't really understand the question. What, what, what is your question? That uh, my question is that it can be explained by mental superposition because the mental superposition makes a concentration of all the information we got by observation of individual experiments. And when we when we go uh, further, after the concentrated, uh, um, after the concentration, then uh, we will have one experiment with one outcome. And this is the uh, collet of uh, multiple to one. Uh, well, pr perhaps my answer will be the same than yesterday. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, I don't agree because there is a confusion between uh, the fact that uh, there are multiple uh, multiple points and uh, the fact that something is superposed. Uh, a superposed state is not something that is similar to uh, a mixture of states. That's different. And uh, I don't know what is a superposition state in uh, psychology. Uh, in physics, it is something that is very precise because we have a mathematical tool allowing to make the distinction between a mixture, a proper mixture, and a superposed state. 
uh, as I said yesterday, uh, if you take a set of uh, uh, n particles half in a state plus uh, for the spin along one axis and uh, the other half with the, sp the spin minus, then this is described by uh, a tool in mathematics that is a mixture. And if you take n particles uh, which are in a superposed state of plus and minus, that will be described by a superposed state, which is not the same tool than the mixture. And the prediction that will, that you get from the mixture are not the same than the predictions that you get from the superposed state. And I don't really see, because that's not, uh, well, I'm not an expert in, in psychology, but I don't really see what that means, uh, when you, uh, when you mention the, the mental states, because I don't know of any formalism for mental states. Mathematical formalism for mental states are not very, uh, uh, very well known. Um, the mental superposition seen from biopsychology is essentially uncertainty. If we have an uncertainty situation, we can only make multiple, uh, multiple um, uh, theories, uh, the, uh, which, which uh, only of, uh, only one of which will be realized later on. So in psychology is essentially the, uh, uncertainty, which is identical to superposition. Okay. But there might be different, uh, superposition yeah. in, in physics. Why not? Uh, that, that, I understand. Uh, uh, that, that's probably the reason why uh, things are different, and why the the the, the hypothesis that the sub mental superposition, in your sense, uh, cannot solve what we physicists want to solve, because what we call superposition is not totally the same thing that what you in psychology call uh, superposition. Uncertainty in physics is not superposition. Superposition okay. is something more than just uncertainty. You can have uncertainty in physics, uh, and it can be described by a mixture. The so position is something that is essentially different, and I'm not sure that uh, there is any uh, corresponding thing in, in, uh, in biology. I don't know, of course, but, and I understand that your, your, your hypothesis is more linked to uncertainty, that's what you say, than to superposition. And superposition is something different. So, uh, uh, your proposition is not able to solve what we try to solve in, in physics. Okay. May I, I give a comment, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, may I comment in... Uh, yes, uh, sure, please, uh, go ahead. Um, I noticed that you, you cite uh, Despagna and... Uh, the way you do it looks at his views are much closer to mine than, than what yourself are thinking or what other people are thinking. Um, I, I just want to state that when you take for granted the idea that there should be ontological states as opposed to, um, to superpositions, then uh, life becomes a lot easier. The measurement problem, for instance, practically disappears. Um, and uh, which, uh, what you have to understand is that, that quantum mechanics is a model of reality, a model that we use to compute things, but that doesn't mean that superpositions are really physical entities at all. The physical world only wor works with, with certainties being yes or no, but nothing in between. Um, now, if you, if you take a, a model, then you can, for instance, look at the vacuum state as opposed to a state which with a particle in there. Both are suppositions of ontological states. So it's very difficult to say the vacuum is ontological. No, it is not. Not completely. But um, also the one particle state is not an ontological state. But certain suppositions are. Now, if you talk about one particle, there's no way to say what is the true reality of nature. But now take a thousand particles... And now you can say, now, what we call the vacuum 
in, in the world around us looks a little bit different from the states with a thousand particles in there. Now, if I take a set of a thousand, I take a thousands of such boxes and I get a million particles, now it starts to become almost certainty how to distinguish the state with a million particles in there from the vacuum state. And now if you look at planets in uh, orbiting the sun, a planet consists of much more than a million particles, so the planet definitely is ontological. And um, uh, all states with classical objects all around us are then ont ontological. From there, it is a small step to say, well, then also the hand of a uh, uh, of, of, of an, uh, a measuring apparatus is also ontological. And in fact, our consciousness is also ontological. Just because all those notions are macroscopic. So once you, what you have to do in physics is to separate the macroscopic things from the microscopic ones. Our models are not sufficiently accurate to distinguish uh, between a macroscopic state there, here, and here, to distinguish that from purely ontological states. They are ontological. So once you say that, when you, when you take a measurement, you say, then I can, uh, I know what the ontological outcome of a measurement is. So, um, that is uh, just a church in one and zeros. But when I look at the atom in our model, the atom in our model was a superposition of states. Ontological states. One of these ontological states is the true state nature is in. And if in the initial state that we worked with, we took the Born amplitudes, the Born probabilities to define the superposition coefficients, then the final state has the same superposition coefficients. But only one of them is truly ontological. So that now you say, okay, I put in my initial state the Born interpretation of the superposition coefficients, in the final state, will, it will be the same thing, because these born amplitudes are absolutely conserved in time. There's an ontological, ontology conservation law of nature. If you take the combination of these facts in our model, then the measurement problem becomes, becomes automatically guaranteed to work the way it's, it's set in what we used to call axioms of quantum mechanics, those are not axioms, those are not additional conditions in our theory. They're just a natural consequence of the way we set up the computation technique in our models. So as a physicist, I say quantum mechanics is a model. The superposition coefficients are models of probabilities. They are conserved in time. And that is why when we do a measurement, we find those same born probabilities back in the measurement. The universe always was only in one ontological state. So this is the extreme opposite of the many world interpretation. But the many world interpretation comes about when you look at what we call a particle and what we call a particle with spin up or spin sideways or spin down. Those, those are then not ontological, but they are gadgets that we use to do our computations with. So because of these facts of our models, we are dealing with situations where we don't know for sure what the real, real situation is. Whereas the universe, for sure, works only with ontological states. So this takes away much of the apparent mystery of quantum mechanics, the problems that Wittner had with his friend, you know, Wittner's consciousness uh, is then superior to his friend's consciousness or the other way around. Uh, all that becomes unnecessary. These notions become macroscopic. If you are a biologist or a psychologist, you're usually only dealing with macroscopic certainties, not with what individual atoms do. So you don't have to worry that what Alice uh, says to Bob, uh, or Bob says to Alice, is anyway different from in their own perspective, from what the, the real world is. No. Once you talk at the level of macroscopic things, such as observers, there's only one ontology in our world. But it's not the ontology that we can use when we try to describe individual atoms and elementary particles. It is a deficiency in our understanding of these particles that causes the confusion uh, that we have uh, in inter interpreting what these particles actually are. But the macroscopic world never gives rise to any of such uncertainties. Uh, so 
Well, um, this is just a comment rather than a question. I, I'm, I'm not sure I've understood the talk well enough to be able to, to criticize what you say, but um, it, it looks as if uh, the, the problem that people have with, uh, with uh, the quantum mecha mechanical superpositions are only a problem with our mathematical models and not with our real understanding of nature, which today is incomplete. I, I wish I had better models to explain in quantitative calculations what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's one question I had. Um, is what you propose uh, similar to complete uh, quantum mechanics with something else, uh, as in the, the hidden variable approach, uh, to, uh, to say that uh, uh, quantum states are not enough to describe the ontological um, things, but that they need to be completed with something else that we don't know yet. And uh, even if we don't know yet, uh, is it possible to think about that as adding uh, one or several hidden variables, and if it is so, then uh, what is the, the relation with the current model of uh, models of uh, uh, hidden variables theory that we have, such as a uh, bomb theory and things like that? Yes, basically, what one has to do is one has to take the the assumption that the world is ontological. One has to take that. It to its full end. One cannot stop halfway. That's, that's the problem with these, these ideas. So, um, what we are dealing with when we do physics of elementary particles, of atoms, of photons, you name it, is that those theories are models. They are not the ultimate truth because we don't know the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth may be something extremely complicated. So complicated that it's hopeless to write all that down in full detail. So what we do is we take our, our, our refuge in a simplified picture where we use superpositions, even if we know that the true world isn't a superposition of ontological states. But it's the only thing that we can describe. One reason is that energy is not ontological. Energy is a, a consequence of superpositions of states. But we like to use energy and when we use thermodynamics, we want to have a, a, a pleasant temperature around us, but temperatures are very low compared to the average energetic state in nature, uh, which is something like the Planck energy. We would all evaporate immediately if we took, take an ontological state in this universe. So temperature is a property of billions and billions of atoms all put together. And... Um, that's exactly the situation that our quantum model doesn't describe so very well. But that's where ontology comes back in. Uh, so a, a very important notion is that large quantities of particles are classical quant are behaving classically because they're the statistics. million particles from a state that's the vacuum state. That we can do for certainty in our models. But um, that's why there's no, no conflict anymore when you look at macroscopic things. The conflict comes if you want to take your atom or your photon or the fields that you describe in, in, in these particles, if you take them all to be ontological, they are not. What is ontological at that level is very, very difficult. And the reason... Uh, why we are so confused in understanding what we are doing is precisely because the underlying equations are too difficult for us to handle exactly. We are forced to use superpositions, and these superpositions give rise to all these confusions when we talk about large objects. I very much like the uh, uh, the uh, approach of Dr. Toft uh, that the reality is deterministic, but so complicated that we cannot see it and that we need models. And these models are mental products, nothing yes. other. So they yes. are mental. And we try uh, with these models to be the most near to nature's reality. All right, so 
Um, well, I'm not so very happy with the word mental. I mean, it, it is as if we are thinking something such, uh, and what we are thinking is important to what nature does. Of course, when we do an experiment with particles at CERN, for instance, when they collide millions of particles against each other, it has nothing to do with our mental state, of course. But we are making the, uh, the laws, the physical laws. We are thinking how they could work. It's a mental work. That is right. So our models are not perfect. And that's yeah, the cause sure. of the, the difficulties that we encounter. Yeah, yeah. That's very, very good. Yeah. I have a question about the, the, the ontology that we can't know, uh, at least today. Uh, is, in your point of view, uh, what, what is the result on a locality? Uh, do you recover locality uh, or not in your... Uh, I think I, I do, uh, because I do not agree with uh, Bell's uh, uh, verdict about... Uh, no kind of being forbidden. That's, uh, I think that's a consequence of his definition of causality, which I do not subscribe to. Okay. So, I don't see any problem with locality, but I should add to that immediately that I do not have a completely satisfactory model of what happens in nature. As, as long as that's the case, you might attack me and say, sorry, but uh, we don't know exactly what locality is. And I agree with that. I, I uh, have difficulties in, in making these models completely uh, succinct and, and, and well-defined. Uh, so, lacking that, I can't really tell you how local our theories of nature actually are. Okay. okay. But, but do, do you think that uh, the, the fact of recovering locality comes from... Uh, the fact that uh, uh, when you, you do the, the EPR experiments, um, the things are done from the beginning because everything has been determined at the beginning. Yes. And that would help to recover locality, for example, which is, uh, in theory, which is forbidden by, by Bell, but if you don't agree with the hypothesis of Bell, of course, you, you can, you can uh, contest that. But is it the reason why, the main reason why you recover locality? Because things are done uh, from the beginning. Oh. Uh, sorry, I, I, I missed some of the question. Um, so, yes, one of the, 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 the cause of our difficulties is that the, indeed the, the true models, the true reality that you're talking about might be infinitely complex or very complex. So that uh, when we describe an atom or a photon or whatever, we are simplifying reality enormously. The only thing we got are the superpositions of ontological states. Those, you know how they evolve. To recover from that, the original ontological states is extremely difficult. Yeah. And uh, when you try, you discover you, you don't succeed. Whether that is because reality is non-local, I doubt that very much. I don't see a good reason why nature should be non-local. In fact, Quantum field theory of elementary particles is so successful because we recover locality in these quantum field theories. We have a, a definition of what locality is there. I don't see why the definition should also not eventually hold up when we have these more complicated models of reality that we don't understand today very well. But I don't see why they should be non-local. And that's because I, I don't quite agree with, with Bell's uh, verdict about causality. Uh, and uh, um, so that also reflects on on, on his opinion about uh, lack of locality. I very much like that you say that uh, mathematical formalism is a simplification of ontology. So simplification is mental because the uh, the nature is complicated. So, simplification is necessary mental. A model, a model is uh, mental. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think the word mental is a bit confusing here. Uh, I would rather say that, that uh, regardless of what our human conditions are, uh, we, we can, a robot could reach the same conclusion about nature. We have 
imperfect models of nature. Nobody should be surprised at the fact that we don't know the perfect reality around us. We only have our models. And uh, these models are not describing any specific situation here, like us sitting uh, here together with, the, with these uh, uh, in computers in front of us. But um, the model is, is just an abstract description of what could be the truth yeah. Yeah. by which abstract atoms interact with each other. Abstract description. And that is mental. <laughs> Mental work to come to abstract description. Yes, I completely agree. Okay, if, if that if that's your definition of mental, then I'm not fine. Sorry, if that is your definition of what mental means, I would have another association with the word mental, uh, uh, like uh -huh. a state of mind, uh, and uh, which is uh, too slippery for us to to use uh, in our models. Okay, so for me, mental are functions with which we are working to come to abstract reflections, to your models. That's all. <laughs> okay. I like it very much, what you said. Thank okay. you. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Street uh, was ready to ask the question. So, yes, my, my question was that, um, you know, there are many quantum effects, probably the vast majority of quantum effects go on without any uh, observer being anywhere near them. I mean, the, you think of radioactivity that goes on. So, I mean, people measure radioactivity, and that's a measurement with an observer, um, and they measure other quantum effects. But physics basically makes the assumption that what applies when... To, to events that, for which there is no observer. And so, um, and the, the experiments that you do, what you see is a spontaneous collapse of the wave function. I mean, radioactivity, spontaneous emission of a particle. Um, in a laser, there's a spontaneous collapse that emits a photon. And one makes those assumptions that, that that's what you see with some probability distribution. Uh, one applies to a device, you calculate what the effect will be, and that's what, that's what is, that, that's what happened. So, my, I guess my question is, what is wrong with the notion that there is a spontaneous collapse with a probability distribution, uh, and that the observer has no role to play in that whatsoever? Uh, it's, it's, it just, it just happens. Um, and, you know, one can apply that uh, probability distribution to events that for which there is no observer. That, that, that's a that's a very good question because that's very frequently uh, an objection to that sort of uh, of presentation. Uh, the reason is that when you say that uh, there is a spontaneous collapse uh somewhere that uh, there is a disintegration of an atom or something like that uh, in the absence of an observer this sentence uh in fact is just something that you can say only in the case you made an observation afterwards allowing you to say or to know that something happened before but if something happens uh, independently of anybody and that you have uh, at no moment any observation of a consequence of what happened, you can't say that this happened. Of course, that is something that is very shocking because in, in the usual way of speaking and in classical physics, we are used to think about the fact that the world is working independently of us and that things happen uh, all the time, everywhere, uh, even in the absence of any human beings. Of course, that's the usual picture that we have of the universe and uh, everybody thinks that. But in this uh, way of uh, uh, describing um, the, the, the interpretation, uh, that becomes false. That means that... Uh, in the absence of observer, then nothing happens. And everything stays in a superposed state. That means that there is no spontaneous 
disintegration. There is one, if there is a consequence that this disintegration that you can observe, and this is only uh, what you will become aware that will allow you to infer that there has been a disintegration, at least in the branch to which you are angled. I know that it's very bizarre, uh, but that's the, 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 the logic of the, the interpretation. So, I, I mean, I, I guess my question is, is that a required, I mean, why does, why does the theory require that? I mean, it seems to me that the notion that you have a probability for a, a, a wave function collapse that I think is calculated and that, and the, you know, the, the consequent being that at some random point that happens and it's entirely independent of the observer. So why is that not why do you think that's not allowed by the theory? Uh, that's not allowed in the interpretation that I give. Uh, and if you assume that uh, the spontaneous collapse, uh, th there are some theories that are trying to develop models of spontaneous collapse. For example, uh, Giardi and Rubini were there. Uh, that's something that is... Uh, providing results that are coherent with, quantum, with the usual quantum mechanics. But usual quantum mechanics does not predict any spontaneous collapse. In the usual quantum mechanics, there is no collapse unless you make an observation or measurement, and there is no definition of what is a measurement. That is, that if you only say that a measurement is an interaction between a system and an apparatus, then you have to use the Schrodinger equation, which is predicting an entanglement and not a collapse. And inside the usual and the standard quantum formalism, there is no way to get a collapse because the evolution is unitary. And the collapse is something that is violating the unitarity of quantum formalism. And the only way to explain that is to say something happened that is not described by the unitary evolution, that is a measurement. But what is a measurement is not saved. And that's the measurement problem, and that's why so many physicists are not in agreement with the solution to, to bring to that. And that's very difficult to, to find a, a good solution for that. But, but what is sure is that you can't, you are not allowed to say that inside the usual quantum formalism, there is a spontaneous collapse. That's, that's not true. That's not correct. Uh, okay, fine. I mean, it, it just seems odd that, that you, know, you know, there are so many, so many measurements and assumptions of, you know, connecting those experiments to things that you, you only know indirectly that, you know, that there is a, a spontaneous collapse. No, because so, every, every interaction between all what you want will result in an entanglement, not in a collapse. And everything will be entangled with everything. And that's the, the picture that is given by Everett. The universe is totally entangled. And that's the, the only way to give a meaning of the Schrodinger equation. And if you want to have a collapse, then you have to provide a way to get it collapse that is not given by the usual formalism of quantum mechanics. The fact that there are many interactions doesn't give a collapse. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, if I understand you well, you say that uh, quantum mechanical superposition uh, is always present, <clears throat> whereas uh, Dr. Toft said that it is only a model, and the model is not equal to reality. So... Uh, I think there's a difference in, in interpretation. Yeah, that, that, that's true. You're right. Uh, what, what I say is different from what uh, uh, Professor Toft says, of, of course. Yeah. That doesn't mean that uh, we are in, in a total disagreement because we are trying to give explanation. And in this field, uh, depending on your uh, a priori uh, philosophical point of view, you can provide different explanations that are acceptable uh, for different people. Uh, 
I am trying here to give an interpretation that assumes, and that was the, 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 the initial point of view of Bernard d'Espagna, uh, that assumes that uh, there is a reality and that the quantum formalism is a trial to model this reality. That's a model, of course, but that's a model of the reality, at least of a sort of a, a kind of modified reality, because the reality I described is not at all the reality that is usually assumed in classical physics. That's not possible. Nobody now uh, tries to uh, recover the classical physics. That's not possible. But uh, the reality I described is very strange. But uh, nevertheless, I try to explain how the model given by quantum mechanics describes the way we perceive the reality. And if I understand that, but I, I'm not sure because, uh, well, yeah, he, he is not here. He would, he would say that much better than me. But what Professor Tuft want to do is something else. But that would be an interesting question to ask him. Uh, if he wants to uh, build a model, okay, but a model of what? And if it's a model of reality and it's what I think, then we have the same hypothesis. The only difference is that he tries to do that by assuming that the property, the underlying fundamental properties are totally unknown and so complex that we can't have any, uh, uh, any, 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 well, it's not <clears throat> possible to grasp them now while I'm just assuming that quantum formalism is the correct one. That's the, the main difference. But I don't think that we are philosophically uh, on a different point of view. A model is models of something. Unless you are a pure instrumentalist saying that your model is not speaking of reality. It's just a tool which has no meaning. And in this case, of course, that's a very different position. But I don't think that uh, Professor Tuft is an instrumentalist. We, we are going to ask him when he, when he, when he comes back. Uh, I think the model should be the best fit to nature's reality without being identical to nature, without being a description of nature. Yeah. But, but, but in saying that, you say that the model is supposed to model reality. And what instrumentalists say is that the model is not at all representing the reality. It's just a, a convenient tool without any meaning, but allowing us to uh, uh, make predictions. But uh, for instrumentalists, you are not allowed to use your model to infer any uh, properties of reality, which is perhaps even not existing for them. That's a very different philosophical position. In any case, models may be changed. Uh, Newton's model had to be changed by Einstein's model. So that shows that uh, models are sometimes very different from reality. Yeah. Uh, Quine, one of the uh, 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 well, famous uh, philosopher of science, uh, called that the undetermination of uh, theories by experiments. And his thesis, which is widely accepted now, is that uh, you can make as many experiments that you want. It would be always possible to build very different and even incompatible models of the same physical events. Yeah. <laughs> And that's in epistemology, that is a thesis that is widely accepted now. And we have a good example. Uh, of course, it's very difficult for physicists to build different theories that are totally different and that are empirically uh, acceptable. But we have a good example with the usual quantum formalism and the, uh, the, 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 the theory of De Bruyne bomb which is doing exactly the same predictions, but whose ontology is totally different. 
And that's the, the, the example that is usually given for uh, explaining this under, under determination of the theories by experiments. Mm. That, that means if, if we are extreme, that means that perhaps we'll never succeed in uh, understanding really the reality because we'll always have many different and incompatible models of this theory, of this reality. Yeah. And, and that's a very important point in epistemology. That, that is something that physicists don't like at all, of course. But in any case, uh, physical formalism is a reduction of complexity, is a simplification. Yeah. If not, couldn't have uh, uh, all this uh, in our minds. <laughs> That, that's true. Uh, uh, the, the, the mathematical formalism of any physical theories uh, is uh, a simplification. But, a simplification. But uh, perhaps you can have many different ways yeah. to simplify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you can be led to many different formalisms. That's right. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, at the end, I would like to have uh, one uh, extra question uh, about the measurement. Uh, can you tell us uh, what uh, what is not a measurement? Because you, all the time uh, we were, you were speaking about measurement, about what is in quantum uh, physics, what is not a measurement? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> But it's not everything. <laughs> a measurement is nothing else than the fact that one observer becomes aware in her mind of something external. So everything else is not a measurement. And especially any interaction between any two systems is not a measurement. And that is something that is very important because many physicists uh, assume that uh, it, it's enough to have an interaction between a micro microscopic system and a macroscopic one, for example, an apparatus, to get a measurement. And uh, in my view, that is not correct. A measurement is not at all a physical process. A measurement is only the way to describe the way an observer becomes aware of something, but when you are, as an observer, doing a measurement, you are not doing something that is physical, and uh, you are doing something that is only mental. That's the way you see something. Assume, I, I'm going to take another example. Assume that uh, you see a, a, a movie, uh, in, a color movie. But assume that uh, before having a look at the color movie, you take at random a pair of glasses, which is colored. Okay, for example, in, in red. Then when you have a look at the movie, you'll have the impression that the movie is red. But the movie is not red. The movie is in many different colors. But due to your glasses, you can only see the movie red. And that's what a measurement is. Taking some glasses and having a look at something that you can't because of your, the, the way your brain is, is working, because of the limitation of your brain, you can't see the, the, the different colors. You are obliged to see only one color through the, the, the glasses. Of course, that's an image, but that, that explains uh, what, what I mean by, by, by this uh, uh, hanging on mechanism. Human brain is not able to perceive directly the superposition because we are not built to do that. And uh, we, uh, uh, now recently, we become uh, more aware of the fact that our brain has many limitations and that uh, our consciousness is not what we thought it was. It, it's much more complicated and much more limited than we thought.
Uh, well, go, going around this along this line, can I ask you? Can is this possible that computer can make a measurement? Huh. That's a good question because that's a, a, a debate I had with some of my colleagues, and my answer is no. Uh oh. Uh, my answer is no, except when, and I don't know if it uh, will be the case in the future, when computers can have feeling. But uh, if, today, today it's no. But, but if, if in the future, and that's an open question. Is the 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 conscious is consciousness an algorithmic process? Uh, that's something that is very complicated. Nobody has a, the, the right answer. Penrose uh, said that it was not possible, but it, it gave wrong reasons for that. Uh, and today nobody knows. And the the, the partisans of the well, what we call the strong IA uh, thesis say that uh, it will be possible because our brain is nothing else than a computer. And some others are not convinced at all by that, and I, I, I don't know that that's something I think that we, we we can't know today. But if computers in the future are able to feel something, in this case they will be able to make measurements. If computers as today are uh, not able to feel something, then they will not be able to make measurements. But in any case. A, a, a mere recording of something that will be done by a computer after an interaction between uh, a, a system and an apparatus is not at all a measurement. And that's a point that is very important because many of my colleagues developed interpretation in which uh, they suppose that uh, doing an experiment with a system and an apparatus and recording that uh, which with a computer is enough to make a measurement. And then they deduce that they have solved the, the measurement problem. And in my view, that's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but provided that you have a Turing machine, it's a theoretical concept, but let's, let's say that we have a Turing machine. Is this, the, would you accept that the Turing machine, the theoretical concept, is capable to do the measurement in the sense as you described before? No, that's the, the answer I, I gave just before. A Turing machine is nothing else than a computer. A computer is a Turing machine. That's the same thing. So right. uh, the question is, uh, is our brain a Turing machine or not? And we don't know. If our brain is a Turing machine, that means that in the future, we'll be able to develop a software able to feel something. In this case, it will be possible to have computer doing measurements Exactly in the same way that our brain does a measurement. If our brain is something different, then uh, no computer will be able to make a measurement in the future. And of course, I don't have the answer for that. I would say if computers made measurements, it would uh, resemble an autistic human. Somebody who has no feelings. <laughs> It's difficult to know. Uh, nobody knows today. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I think uh, the computers, they do make measurements. We just read in, uh, what is the output from the computer, and, and that is the result of the measurement. Uh, uh, a, com a, a computer, a today computer, is not doing a measurement because uh, if you uh, have a look at a computer in, in the, the, the correct description of quantum mechanics, the computer is entangled with the superposed system exactly in the same way that the apparatus is entangled. Mm -hmm. And so there is no measurement made. A measurement is nothing else than the awareness of one part of the entangled state. That's not a physical process. A measurement is not a physical process. A measurement is uh, becoming aware of something. And what happens is that due to the limitation of our brain, we cannot become aware of a superposed state. But that's, that's it. In fact, that is very simple. Once you have separated the physical processes and what we as human observer can perceive, then the problem is solved. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Uh, so uh, thank you for your nice talk and uh, a good number of questions.